And now, Daljit Dhaliwal. The disputed Kashmir region has been fought over three times by India and Pakistan. Most recently, the Mumbai terror attacks have been linked to Islamic extremists demanding that India give up control of the territory and its majority Muslim population. Despite the region's violent and convoluted history, there may be hope for this part of the world, often described as paradise on earth. For insight and analysis on this troubled region, we're joined by Durga Jaishankar, a specialist on South Asia. Welcome to the program. Thank you. What is the status of peace talks with respect to India and Pakistan and Kashmir? In 1999, um, shortly after the Indian Prime Minister visited Pakistan uh, for, for peace talks, uh, a last major conflict broke out between India and Pakistan over the region. Um, since then, um, talks have gone off and on. The last sustained dialogue uh, took place between 2004 um, and 2008. Uh, 2004 was when a new government came to power in India, uh, led by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Um, and uh, you had what was uh, the formal composite dialogue, which was um, discussing a number of issues, uh, outstanding issues between India and Pakistan, including Kashmir. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, special representatives of uh, the Indian Prime Minister and Pakistani President Musharraf uh, were conducting a series of back-channel talks, um, which, uh, if reports are to be believed, uh, came very close to uh, a negotiated, an, an, an acceptable negotiated settlement uh, on the Kashmir issue. Right. So what, what are the contours of that plan or that roadmap, if we, if we can describe it as that? And um, do you feel personally that you know that, that the time is riper now for a settlement on Kashmir than it has been um, since uh, partition in 1947? Um, the time is not yet ripe. Um, I don't think so. I think the Mumbai terrorist attack had a, a, a very uh, strong uh, and detrimental effect on, on, on the, the Indian psyche. Uh, it, 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 uh, I mean, I think Indians felt like. Uh, that was really, it was really hard for them to uh, overcome that. Um, but uh, I, I think the broad contours of the plan are basically fivefold. Uh, they include uh, basically recognizing the current line of control between India and Pakistan as the international boundary. Um, so that basically that would include that would mean uh, no exchange of territory between India and Pakistan. Um, secondly, it would involve it may involve some uh, level of autonomy uh, for both. Uh, the, the so areas. what happens to the line of control? That remains, that sort of becomes like a, a soft line rather than a hard line? Well, uh, two things happen. One is it's recognized as the international boundary. So, so legally, uh, bo both sides recognize that that will not be changed. Uh, at the same time, the, the, the catchphrase that makes its way in policy circles is making the borders irrelevant. So basically allowing, making it uh, por porous enough to allow um, the exchange of goods and uh, people across that border. Uh, and, and then uh, demilitarization of, of the area uh, commensurate with a decrease in terrorist violence, um, I think is, is, would, would be another essential mm -hmm. element of that. Uh, is, is it a dormant border right now? Um, no, it's, th there's activity across it uh, from time to time. Um, infiltration, I mean, w one of the problems that India has um, is that uh, there's a history of cross-border infiltration uh, from the Pakistani side. Um, that's reduced uh, dramatically over the last decade, uh, since at least 2001. Um, and uh, for, for two reasons. One is it's widely believed that the Pakistanis are, for a variety of reasons, um, cracking down uh, upon uh, the, the, the militant infrastructure on, on their side of the line of control. Uh, and secondly, India has basically hardened the, board, the, the barrier between it. So it's, so it's become harder uh, for people to infiltrate uh, from Pakistan to India. Uh, except at very high altitude. Uh, mm. That. W what about the position of the military bureaucracy in both uh, countries, especially the intelligence services? I mean, are they completely supportive of this uh, roadmap? Um, it, it's unclear. Um, I think uh, they, they naturally have their uh, their own agendas, and there are definitely voices um, in both security establishments that do want to see uh, a move towards uh, a, a negotiated settlement. Uh, again, if if, um, if reports are to be believed, I mean, a, a lot of the progress was made under General Musharraf, who, uh, you know, who who was the army chief as well as president, uh, and he he brought along, uh, he seems to have brought along 
a lot of the, the military hierarchy on, on the Pakistani side. On the Indian side, uh, there, there is some resistance, it appears, from the army brass to demilitarization which, which, uh, w within Kashmir. Um, and it's something that both the Kashmiri, the, the Jammu and Kashmir chief minister, Omar Abdullah, uh, who was recently elected, he's, he's been a very vocal proponent of partial demilitarization uh, on his side, on, on the Indian side. Uh, and he, has, he seems to have an ally in uh, India's home minister in Delhi, uh, Chidambaram, who was made the home minister after the Mumbai attacks. Uh, so I think there is, um, um, I mean, th there, there are agents of, uh, um, I mean, there are definitely agencies that want to see progress uh, on both sides. So, uh, so the resistance, it sounds like it's, it's going to come from political circles, not necessarily, necessarily from the military on either side or the intelligence services or even the two communities that live on both sides of the line of control. I, I think that's probably true more on the Indian side. I mean, in, 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 on the Pakistani side, um, the military remains a, a potent political force uh, and it has at various points of time um, exercised that more overtly than at other times. Where does the Kashmiri narrative fit into this process? I mean, you know, the citizens of Jammu and Kashmir, um, you know, who, who are often eclipsed by uh, the political parties on both sides in India and in Pakistan. Um, I mean, the, the, the insurgency starting in 1990 grew out of uh, a great deal of domestic um, resentment. And uh, certainly as, as the, the insurgency raged throughout the 1990s, uh, the, many of those grievances were not really addressed. There, there is room for optimism, though, because in, in, in late last year, in November and December, the, Jammu, uh, the people of Jammu and Kashmir went to polls, and uh, the vo voter turnout was surprisingly high. It was 61% uh, overall, and it was 45% in the major cities, which, um, which is also surprisingly high. I mean, that's where, where a lot of the disturbances have taken place. Um, so uh, and then uh, and and they elect the, you know they, they that led to a change in government. Uh, so I mean he, he, here were the Kashmir people exercising um, their 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 ability to vote, and I think that was very encouraging. It's it, it appears from from a number of indicators that people have people's appetite for violence has really just decreased over time uh, as the rage, as the insurgency has raged. Uh, and uh, violence levels have, have, have dropped considerably. I mean, estimations now are that there are about 600 to 700 active insurgents in Jammu and Kashmir, which really isn't very many. Uh, it's below 1,000 for the first time, I think, since 1990. Okay, thank you very much for coming on the program and uh, giving us your perspectives on this roadmap. It's uh, certainly something we'd like to come back and talk about a little bit more. Thank you very much.